Hello, everybody. It is raining in Santa Monica, California. I am your host, Amanda Kulong, this week in cloud computing. Everybody, I am Amanda Kulong, if you didn't hear a second ago, host of This Week in Cloud Computing. This is episode number 33. It really is raining in Santa Monica today. My car is finally clean, for those of you who have been wondering. My sweet little Aphrodite is white again. Um, a number of things to talk about today, but first off, I want to introduce my trusty co-host, Dave Linthicum, who's joining us back on Skype again. <laughs> hey, how are you? You guys can suffer in the rain because you don't get enough in California. Oh, shush. I left New England to avoid the rain. Avoid it, Dave. <laughs> suffer. Suffer. Because it's <laughs> horrible out here from now until March. So, oh, uh, fine. You just, you'll just have to come back out and enjoy the sunshine and palm trees with us. Absolutely. <laughs> so, Dave, you're going to be record, uh, reporting live from Cloud Expo in San Jose. When is that? Uh, that's going to be um, on the 3rd of November. Okay. That's in about weeks and I'm going to be yeah. there probably thousands and thousands of cloud computing enthusiasts and I will report on the latest updates from the event to you Excellent. this week in cloud computing to the audience. I am excited about that one because I have a few people I want you to approach and make victims. I'll approach in a good people. way. In a good yeah. way. <laughs> so make sure you all tune in for that special edition of This Week in Cloud Computing. We also have joining us today on the phone our Ray Wang, who is a partner for enterprise strategy at Altimeter Group. And he's also the author of the popular enterprise blog, A Software Insider's Point of View. So nice having you on air as well, Ray. Hello, hello. Hi, Amanda. Hi, David. How are you guys doing? Great, great to have you, and we will get into a discussion with Ray here shortly. Um, we have some, a few other quick updates. Uh, this Week in Cloud Computing is looking for more sponsors. If you are interested, you can email sponsor at thisweekend.com or mo, M-O, at thisweekend.com. And to participate, you can join us in the Ustream chat room here uh, or follow us on Twitter at TweeCloudComp and use the hashtag uh, TWICC for This Week in Cloud Computing. And please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on iTunes, and rate our shows. Because if you rate them and you comment on them, we can make them better for you. So without further ado, I think we have to uh, pay attention to some of these clouds that are coming into the studio. Hmm. Shield Maiden. Yes? Ragnarok is upon us once again. Who's that? Oh, never mind. Just go with it. Okay. Storm! Storm on demand! Storm on demand! Storm on demand is an infrastructure as a service, a cloud computing platform that is powerful enough, powerful enough to replace dedicated servers. A proprietary cloud platform designed by Liquid Web, one of the largest web hosting providers with over 12 years of experience. It is easier to use and less expensive than Amazon EC2. Features include server setup in minutes, Easy scaling, backup and restoration capabilities, and pay-as-you-go utility-style billing. Options include cPanel, Fantastico, Ubuntu, Debian, CentOS, fully managed servers, private networking, and swords like this, and little guys that we do not have in this commercial, but it doesn't matter, because this is cooler. Storm On Demand can be found at stormondemand.com, at Storm On Demand. Ragnarok be damned. Storm on demand! If you do not get storm on demand, I will come to your house with my sword and make you get it. Oh. Storm on demand, folks. We actually use them here at thisweekend.com, so make sure you check them out. You can follow them on Twitter, at Storm on Demand. And if you follow them and say hi to them, you might even get a little guy like this. These are the little guys that Mark was talking about, and I'm personally in love with them. So I think we also have some news that we need to get to. Novell, we haven't really talked about Novell on the show before, have we, Dave? No, no, they're really? out there. They're 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 in the cloud like everybody else. Yeah. So let's let's jump into some some cloud news with Novell. They have revealed the result of their own survey of more than 200 IT leaders. I really wish we knew who they were, by the way, Novell, um, that were at large enterprise organizations. 
And um, the company found that cloud computing adoption is accelerating much faster than suggested by previous research, particularly involving private cloud architectures. We talked a lot about private cloud here, the growth of private cloud specifically. Bottom line is this, private cloud deployments, not the increasing sales of public cloud services, may well be the most important trend in enterprise IT. So if these survey numbers are close to reality, we don't know for sure, we don't know who these 200 people were, does this actually represent a tectonic shift, so to speak, in the perception of enterprise IT management around cloud computing? Dave. I think that cloud computing is more acceptable in enterprise IT than it was a year ago, and this survey really kind of bears that out. Cloud, uh, private cloud computing is the path of least resistance for a lot of these enterprises, because okay. as many instances, as we talked about on this show, they'll just rename what they're doing, their enterprise-y kinds yeah. of projects, as private clouds. And I think that's perfectly fine. And they are getting into virtualization and true multi-tenancy, and they're looking at hybrid cloud environments, things like that. This kind of goes flies in the face of the uh, another survey I saw from Red Monk last mm -hmm. week where they talked about the stealthy rise of public clouds and how those seem to be rising you know just as fast if not faster than some of the private cloud stuff yeah. putting this all together cloud computing is starting to accelerate it's accelerating via private clouds is accelerating via public clouds everybody's interested to it interested in it it's politically correct within the enterprises to support it and yep. say you support it so I, I think this is uh, this is probably a correct survey okay. Ray, what are your thoughts on this one? I mean, on a software insider's point of view, you talk a lot about just enterprise and you do talk about the cloud. Would you say that pri that the private cloud is the fastest path? You know, the private cloud is the easiest one for customers who are worried about all these security issues or right. thinking about privacy issues. And so we definitely see that coming. But one of the things that's been happening is really we've been looking at 10 ways that people are getting onto the cloud. And it's anything from just picking up a point solution or going the best of breed, yeah. fast approach all the way to private clouds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I definitely am curious to see what you're getting on the research side with Altimeter Group, and we'll get to that later on. Um, this next story, I, I just think, is, is funny. Again, we've got Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer is making headlines yet again. What is it with these CEOs making headlines as it relates to cloud computing with these speeches and these great sound bites? Um, he gave a speech at the London School of Economics. The first 30 minutes of the speech was all about cloud computing. So in Ballmer's words, and I quote, I'm not going to apologize for our investment in cloud computing. We have to invest in the long run and not just the short term. We're sticking with what we believe. Even. Then two days ago, Goldman Sachs downgraded Microsoft's stock to neutral, warning that a slower PC refresh cycle and the growth in tablet competition would hold back the company. And Microsoft reportedly committed around 70% of research and development staff to focus specifically on cloud computing. So does Balmer have his head in the clouds? Yes, I had to go there. Will Microsoft find a silver lining in the cloud? Yes, I went there too. Dave. <laughs> Yeah, this just in cloud computing is successful and IBM and excuse me, Microsoft is excited about it. <laughs> but the bad news is cloud computing is successful and Microsoft's not excited uh, Microsoft's not excited about that. Because if you look at this, in essence, we're moving into cloud computing. We're outsourcing things outside of the firewall. So the PCs and the operating systems and the databases, things that typically Microsoft has made a lot of money at in the past really aren't going to be relevant anymore going forward, or as, mm -hmm. as relevant going forward. So in essence, they're moving into cloud computing, but they're also moving away from the traditional business. So they can't win for losing here. Yeah, yeah. Now, Ray, what are your thoughts on this one? I mean, their bread and butter is going to be going away. Have they, got, have they come to the cloud too late? No, they haven't. The cloud computing piece has just started. And on one end, they've got to battle Google on the low end of the market, coming after them with free email and enterprise collaboration. And on the high end, mm -hmm. you know, they've got all these software companies that are coming in from Salesforce.com right. uh, with their CRM offering and Microsoft Dynamics CRM offering. So across the board, cloud is going to be one of those models. But let's be realistic. It's going to be hybrid all the way. Yeah. Right? Not, people aren't going to be super religious and say, I'm going all cloud and that's it. And people aren't going to say, oh, forget this thing. It's a fad. Well, wait, wait. Wait, Bomber himself said he was all in in the cloud earlier on. Do you remember that? Yeah, he's all in, but you know, <laughs> honestly, customers aren't ready to go all in right. yet, nor, nor his partners. So yeah, no, I would yeah, and I think I think Microsoft saw that. If you look at the Azure appliance a year ago, they said they would never uh, produce a private cloud product. Now they're Azure Azure is there an appliance, and mm -hmm. so you can buy a private or a public cloud version of that software. So I agree with Ray. I think they're trying to hedge their bets and moving toward the hybrid model. Absolutely. Yeah. And David's point is actually really interesting. If you think about where we are in this tech cycle, we've gone oh. back 40 years. 
yeah. what is a cloud in a box? It's an AS400 machine. It's, it's like, <laughs> it's like an, I mean, these appliances, I mean, we've, we've come back 40 years. Time sharing, you know, mainframe time sharing, that's the cloud. So we haven't really innovated. We've just went back to history. It's just back to the future. True. Yeah, you're talking about time travel. That's a Mark Jeffrey subject right there. Mark Jeffrey, the CEO of ThisWeekend.com. <laughs> um, Dave, we've got to jump into you here. Let the cloud to cloud sniping begin. So let's talk a little bit here about Larry Ellison, yet another figure that we love to follow in terms of quotes. You know, Larry is saying that he's trying to define the essence of the cloud, um, which is a marked departure from his past rage against the cloud computing machine. So um, do you want to talk about Information Week's report with this and, and Ellison talking about Oracle's new cloud in a box and how it's different from Salesforce? Yeah, this 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 can be uh, this week in dumb things that CEOs say. <laughs> let me tell you, um, the reality is this of this is this is kind of funny because he kind of raged against Salesforce.com and he said, "You guys aren't really a cloud because you don't support virtualization." Well, they don't need to support virtualization for what they do as a software as a service play, and they've proven that they've been successful with the architecture that they've been living with for the last you know 12 years. So I didn't really kind of understand that comment, and mm -hmm. we're starting to see this this sniping between the various larger clouds. Providers. In, in the case, Larry Ellison owns a private cloud, you know, the whole X logic thing, and Salesforce is a completely different product. And it doesn't make logical sense when a lot of these comments are flying back and forth. It's almost like the CEOs and the leaders out there don't even understand technologically what they're offering. And this was the case <laughs> within Larry Ellison, and I, it was just completely perplexing to me when I read the article. But he said it, and we're getting all this kind of sniping going back and forth, and it, it just has a negative effect on everything. Ultimately, it's going to put a damper on cloud computing in general. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure his PR people were cringing. <laughs> Ray, what are your thoughts on this when he's saying, you know, not really cloud computing because its applications aren't virtualized and all these other, other silly statements? There are lots of ways to skin the cat in cloud computing, and I think Larry's trying to brand his. He's probably a little bit upset that, you know, Mark Benioff's been out there evangelizing this for so long. And, yeah. you know, after last year where he said, you know, this stuff doesn't exist, it's a fad, it's like fashion, mm -hmm. you know, I think we're just coming back, and he, he's trying to get his way back in here and say, well, I'm more like Amazon, and they're right. not. <laughs> yeah, Oracle's definitely done a 180. And by the way, Dave, I see you over there. Are you drinking out of, out of a Dunkin' Donuts mug? I no, saw no, orange and pink. No, it's just a, uh, it's some tchotchke I got at a conference. The next I don't, time you come back to the West Coast, I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, Dunkin' Donuts. I Munchkins. They don't have I them out know. here. I know. Thank you. Munchkins are the best. Anyway, it, just, just a side tangent. You know, we're all hungry here at the studio. We need to eat. No kidding. <laughs> um, talking about Salesforce. Uh, Salesforce is now partnering with NTT to open a data center in Tokyo for the growing customer base in Japan. So actually Salesforce had revealed, I think it was back in May, that they were going to open a new data center in Tokyo, um, mainly because they wanted to accommodate those Japanese firms that needed to store their data within the country's borders. You know, we've talked a lot about um, what, the, what the rules are and how they differ from country to country. I'm wondering if that's a piece of this. Um, the facility is going to help the company's growing customer base there, and it's supposed to be completed around 2011. So um, is this a larger trend that cloud computing providers are going to expand their points of presence in other countries to specifically address these compliance issues, Dave? Yeah, we talked about this last week in terms of right. the European compliance regulations and the fact of the matter is that in many instances, financial data and lots of PII data and medical records and things like that can't leave the borders. And a lot of cloud providers don't have points of presence in all the countries that they serve. So Salesforce in moving or creating a point of presence using a partner like NTT, and it's a good company, I've, I've dealt with them before, is the right thing to do because they can get around some of these regulations so they can store different types of data on these systems. They can start onboarding some very very particular customers that have from some very specific compliance issues to deal with. So we're going to see a lot of this, a lot of data centers in France, a lot of data centers in Germany, a lot of data centers on the uh, specific rim. And it's uh, probably a step in the right direction. Cloud's going to be pervasive and it's going to run all over the place. Mm -hmm. Ray, any points on this one? You know, Dave's spot on. I mean, this is really, I mean, if you look at the Japanese market, the big Japan post win by Salesforce and a whole bunch of other partnerships that are going over there really creates a demand for them to have a Japanese uh, data center. Plus, it gives them an entry point into China, which is one of the big things. People really don't want to put their data centers in China right now, but they want a way out. And so it gets them closer there. Singapore's probably next on our list. Okay. Australia, that's another place where you definitely take a look. Mm -hmm. 
Well, we'll have to keep our eyes open for that because we were talking about are, are these other countries being held back because of compliance issues, but clearly we were seeing you know data centers cropping up. So um, let's move along to a Wall Street Journal report that's talking about IT budgets are rising despite lower spending on hardware and software because of the rise of cloud computing. So spending on hardware, however, is expected to drop as companies become more, rel more reliant on cloud computing. This is an interesting point for me because previously we've had discussions about, well, is spending on hardware really going to drop? Because what about the hybrid model yet again? Things like that. So will the increase in IT spending also mean more expectations around return on investment considering the impact of cloud computing? Dave. Yeah, I, I kind of disagree with that portion of the article. I think yeah. the, fact, the fact of the matter is, is that people are buying hardware and software and they're building their private cloud systems. They're building data centers, believe it or right. not. There's a huge expansion in Imagine data centers. Imagine that. Obviously, Still hardware and software. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hardware and software has to get in there. Um, but ultimately, I do agree with the rise in consulting. So in other words, there's mm -hmm. lots of cloud computing going on right now, and they need talent in these organizations to move them forward. And that seems to be a big growth area. Like any other paradigm shift, the consultants win. And I think of the world of cloud computing, that's the case. And I think the rise in IT spending is going to go for more of the services and talent ultimately than hardware and software, but yeah. everything's going to rise. Hmm. Ray, do you agree with that? Do you think it's going to be services and talent, or or do you think it's on the hardware software side? I think the services and talent is uh, probably going to be going to take a little bit of a back seat. Uh, people are really investing in IT and technology right now, so they don't have to hire people. And when we talk to, I've talked to about 60-some CIOs in the last three weeks, and literally they're looking at making big purchases, mm -hmm. but they're not looking at adding people. And so the services yeah. are going to continue to get outsourced or continue to be pushed out into contracts. Everybody's afraid to take on fixed costs despite how much money's in the market. Yeah. All these companies are flush, but nobody's spending on people. So yeah. I think we've got a little while to go. Yeah, I think so too. Um, and I, this is actually not in our notes, folks, but Dave, you sent me an, an email before the show about a new coalition, another coalition, yet again, um, that was announced at VMworld. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, new Scale, Our Path, and Eucalyptus Systems specifically have formed this, um, this new coalition, and it's asking, you know, Amazon can do it, why can't we? Yeah, exactly. And I think this is basically <laughs> rising around the whole private cloud space. Uh, the ability to basically, it's another coalition around cloud computing. I uh, sent a note back to them. I'm going to actually get some more details about okay. what they're looking to do, perhaps even invite them on the cloud, cloud on, our, on, the, yes. uh, on the show here and, uh, and have them explain themselves. But really the point of the matter is, is that, is that pretty much every week something is coming across my desk where there's a bunch of vendors who have gotten together and created some kind of standards organizations or coalitions and things like that. And, you know, God bless them. I hope they do well. It's just there's so many of them. It becomes very confusing to the end users out there. And I'm out there every day with people trying to figure out this market. Mm -hmm. And yet some somebody else I have to explain in terms of how these guys exist in the context of everything else out there and ultimately what they need to pay attention to and what they don't need to pay attention to. So we'll find out what these guys are all about. But, you know, here it is, another coalition. Absolutely. You know, it's so fragmented. You're looking at, we're trying to look at standardization, best practices, those sorts of things. And if you have all of these different coalitions, which one do you back? Which one do you follow? Um, if you are interested, it's www.nrecloud.com. Not NRA, NRE cloud.com. <laughs> So on that note, I um, want to go into another advertiser here on thisweekin.com. If you haven't heard of Gazelle, check them out, www.gazelle.com. It's actually the easiest and fastest way to sell or recycle your gadgets. So if you have um, old phones, old hardware, software, whatever that you want to get rid of, um, the average customer makes more than $100 every time they gazelle their gadgets. So if you use the promo code TWI5, Five, you will get a 5% bonus on the final trade-in value of your items. So this code applies to all products but media. And let's pull it up on screen. There you go. Um, so all products but media, and it can be used once per customer. Nearly 100,000 people have used Gazelle to safely rid themselves of unwanted gadgets and earn some cash while doing it. So you can sell or recycle your gadgets. I know that a lot of you that are techies out there like me, you've probably got a box of stuff sitting around. You know, some of it's, you know, brag worthy, but a lot of it you can just get rid of. So put it out there on gazelle.com. 
So let's jump into a discussion now with Ray. So Ray, you are a partner for enterprise strategy at Altimeter Group, and you also have a blog that's softwareinsider.org. Now, um, talk a little bit about your background because you previously were VP and principal analyst at Forrester. Um, what, what, were, what was your focus there and then what brought you to Altimeter Group? Well, I've been looking at uh, next generation applications and really helping people with application strategy. So anything from buying the software to figuring out how to negotiate the software contracts to thinking about, you know, what the implementation is going to look like. And that's a lot of the work that I've done uh, from Forrester for the last five years before I came to Altimeter Group. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, I've had roles doing software implementations, uh, at, you know, working on SAP implementations, working for product management at Oracle and PeopleSoft, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, even at a couple startups. I was at a web analytics startup in right before the dot-com crash called Personify. <laughs> around their marketing and so it's a wide range of roles but yeah. in this role I'm really there for our clients and really end users helping them understand what's happening I mean there's these right. five forces of change that keep happening cloud mobile social analytics and game theory and yeah. video and unified communications and those five things are driving a lot of you know a lot of confusion uh, really within what our clients are looking at well, that, that's one thing that we can talk about here is just the confusion of cloud computing. We talk a lot about the different definitions. We do see CEOs that are, you know, constantly saying that your cloud company isn't doing what our, it's, that's not the cloud. And cloud washing is a big term that we use here. So what are you seeing as an analyst in the industry and, and, and particularly as, as it relates to enterprise and, and just cloud computing in general? What, what, how are people defining it mainly from, from your side? I think it really, and that's a really good point. It depends on the role you're in. Yeah. Like we see four layers in the crowd. Yeah. Uh, really starting from thinking about, you know, consumption, which is really the apps portion, creation, which is really development tools in the cloud, to orchestration, which is like the middleware, which is the platform right. as a service layer, and then to the infrastructure portion, which is really the IAS. And there are four flavors of cloud computing. And when you say I'm going to the cloud, everybody has kind of a different definition. So the first yeah. part is getting everyone to the same point uh, in the conversation. Mm -hmm. and then after that, really, it's, it's really about how do I jump into the cloud? I mean, do I think about this at a point solution level? Right. Um, do I keep buying all these point solutions? Or do I end up in best of breed SaaS hell? What do mm -hmm. I do? Right? How do I integrate and pull all these things together and bring all these islands of information into, into place? And so clients are just trying to figure out which SaaS strategy makes business sense for them, which cloud strategy makes business sense for them, mm -hmm. and you know, do I just get rid of my whole data center? Yeah. So I think all these things are on the table, especially given where the economy is and given where people want to be able to free up some money to innovate. Mm -hmm. Who would you say is benefiting the most from cloud computing right now? We've had this discussion quite a bit in terms of, you know, you've got startups, then you have, you know, different industry verticals, you've got the large enterprises. I mean, who's really benefiting in this moment with cloud? You know, I think you're, I think you're right. It's, um, it's, it is startups in one sense because they're able to get their products out to market so quickly. Mm -hmm. And instead of just going through one distribution channel or being stuck on a specific language like .NET or Java right. or being stuck as an Oracle partner or IBM partner, any person, any company can get a product and solution into anybody's hands. Mm -hmm. And so they've got such a huge distribution reach and they can go out and build those last mile solutions. Right. Customers benefit because they can test and try uh, before you know, before they go out and see if this is a company they want to work with, if this is the right solution for them. They can even go out and use custom development in the cloud in their own uh, way. And then I think the, you know, the third piece of really people that are benefiting from the cloud uh, are really just, you know, users, right? right. And for the first time, they have access to all these different solutions that they couldn't get to before. And I mm -hmm. think just on a user level, I mean, the amount of sharing and collaboration that's Absolutely. occurring is, is really, really changing how we view our software to the point where all the consumer innovations are popping up first and then going into the enterprise. That's a really good point. You know, it starts on the consumer side and now we're seeing a lot of these cloud computing providers trying to aim at the enterprise and target the enterprise. So with that, with that in mind, how are you seeing businesses, specifically the enterprise side, adapt to cloud computing? How are they dipping their toes in the water, so to speak? Well, I think it depends on, you know, what the 
uh, what the what the uh, composition of the uh, IT sure. team and the business teams are like. Mm-hmm. I mean, if people are innovative. People are really trying to make a difference. Uh, they're happy to do that. But we also have a group of people that are happy with status quo. Right. And so they're just holding off until they retire. So we've got this bifurcation in terms of the age levels and in terms mm-hmm. of the experience levels uh, in a lot of these companies where it really depends if, if people are really in innovative, fast-moving businesses, mm-hmm. they're jumping to the cloud. If people are in right. places where the systems work, nobody wants to touch them, and you know, people are on their way to retire. Retirement, not much interest, not much adoption. Yeah, that's a good point. Is there a certain point person within enterprises, a certain title, a certain hat that you're seeing that, that's really become the decision maker, or is it does it depend on the culture? Does it depend on the company? Well, we did this interesting survey uh, mm-hmm. probably about three months ago where we went out and talked to like 47 CIOs and said, are you using cloud in these major biz- business enterprise applications? Yeah. And they came back, and I think something like 15, 16 of them came back and said, third of them came back and said, hey, yeah, we're using the cloud, but we're not going to touch all the other stuff. We then went back and talked to the procurement organizations of all these companies, and they all came back and said, oh, yeah, we've got a contract with these guys. We're definitely using cloud and SaaS. <laughs> and it turns out that everybody was using it. So I think it's, there's a lot of stuff healthy cloud stuff going on, but yeah. the business units are just swiping and buying and saying, oh, I'm sorry, we're using it. Right. Come sue me. You know? so. Yeah, exactly. Now, how, how is the cloud currently impacting the structure of businesses, or, or ultimately, how do you think it's going to impact the structure overall? Well, I think we've got a lot of innovation, but as Dave would probably tell you as I'm reading through, you know, uh, through your articles and, and through your coverage, I mean, there's going to be a lot of integration nightmares. There's a lot of data that's out there that shouldn't be out there. And at some point, we've got to bring all this back in somehow to have a level of governance, a level of security. <laughs> we've got to make sure that all this stuff talks with each other and plays nicely. And so when we're out there, you know, proclaiming that SOA is dead, well, it's, it's going to be back in one way or another because all this yeah. stuff has to make sense within an organization and with all the partners that are out there. Yeah, and people are calling for, for better SLAs, too. Uh, who yeah, should, SLAs okay. as well. Yeah. Um, who shouldn't be using the cloud? I think that we're at a point where most people can kind of use the cloud. There are some organizations that might be really top secret. They might instead use private clouds, but that's right. still in the cloud. But, you know, private cloud is just... To call a very optimized data center. It's one way to look at it. So I, I think there are very few organizations that would do that. Unless you're, if you're really trying to get off the grid, you don't want to connect with anybody else. Mm-hmm. You might be doing some kind of top secret research. Uh, that I could see you not being in the cloud. Right. Right. Um, if you're doing heavy customization, building these applications that are really complex that you don't want to share out with everybody and you don't want to put on any kind of common infrastructure, mm-hmm. then you might want to do that. But I, I think there are going to be rare exceptions. Right. Now, as someone who talks about the cloud a lot, I always say, do you eat your own dog food? What are some SaaS apps that you personally really enjoy using? Well, I'm in the midst of trying to test out Lotus Live, Google Apps, and Microsoft BPOS because okay. I really need a really good collaboration solution. We're currently using Google Apps right now, and there's right. some things we I are. miss about Exchange. There's some things I miss from my Lotus Notes days, and mm-hmm. there's some things I miss just in collaboration. So those are things we use. Social Cast is one that we use internally. Oh, yeah. It's one that we go out, and it's great for internal collaboration. really cuts down on our email. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you know we're Salesforce users. We go out and we use that from a CRM perspective. But we're testing, and you know all the new stuff is on SaaS. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if you think about just LinkedIn or cloud in general, I mean, LinkedIn's cloud, Facebook's exactly. cloud, eBay's cloud, everything's already out there. So I, I'd say it's, it's just pervasive around us. Right. And last, last question for me, and then Dave, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Um, are any emerging trends that you're seeing right now or that we might potentially see through the end of the year based on, based on what you've been seeing? Are you there? Oh, I think I think think Dave I'm just going to toss it over to you while we get Ray back. Yeah, absolutely. I think oh, I'm here. One you are? Okay. All right. So yes, just emerging trends. Any anything that you're seeing right now um, starting to trickle, bubble up um, or any any predictions that you have through the end of the year? Cloud security. Cloud security is one where people are really spending a lot of time and investment on. Uh, they're trying to make sure that their systems aren't going to be hacked or compromised. They're trying to make sure that they're following the right data privacy requirements. Uh, there are people are really looking at making sure that they've got the fail-safe systems in place. Just because something is SaaS 70 compliant, it's not good enough. There's some great work Absolutely. going on at the Cloud Security Alliance. Uh, we saw a lot of them. Uh, we're on some of the cloud panels we were on at Witty, 
And, uh, and I right. think they did a really good job of talking about all these things. There are no standards out there. And mm-hmm. so people should start getting active in terms of figuring out what the standards are for their industry uh, and in some of their use cases. Okay, great. Well, Dave, I will now toss it over to you. Any questions you have for Ray? Yeah, what are you know some of the top couple of things that people um, would push back on the cloud for? So, in other words, when you're you're actually explaining the cloud to people, you know, what are you know some of the things real and unreal that your clients would uh, w- would say is a reason for them not to use cloud computing? We see some cases where people are in very politically charged environments, uh, and in terms of public sector areas where people, you know, just one mishap in a healthcare record being out there, or someone who's doing heavily regulated industries, like one insurance record, one financial record, they're a little bit more cautious. So they're more likely to go and say, I want to do this private cloud thing because I feel all that data is within us. Even when you look at the government, like the stuff that Viva Kundra and Anish Chopra mm-hmm. are doing out there, the federal CIO and federal CTO, I mean, they're looking at private clouds as a way to consolidate, you know, definitely defense uh, usages as well as, you know, public healthcare records and things like that. So where would you tell your clients to get started? So they're, they're looking at cloud computing. They, they've listened to this podcast. They think it's, it's something that they re- should really look at going forward. What's step one, step two, and step three? Step one is think about the business case that you're after, right? Are you trying to go after new functionality? Are you trying to consolidate a data center? Are you trying to really extend your application development environment? I mean, if you've got big peaks and valleys, there's a way to kind of leverage you know, leverage the utility computing model. And start with that business case. Get it down. And once you have that in place, then we can start thinking about the right solutions, the right technologies, the right approaches. Because if you don't have that solid business case, it's, it's going to be very hard to, you know, go back and figure out, oh, I'm just doing cloud to be cool. Well, now, why are you doing cloud? Are we saving money to do something else? Is it creating innovation? So first step, business case. Second step, then figure out the right set of solutions. Almost every single new startup in software is in the cloud. I don't know. I can't think of any. I'm trying hard right. to think of any software company that's been funded that's going to be an on-premise enterprise software company. I mean, I don't know if those exist anymore, but, but you're going to find a lot of solutions in the cloud. So at that point, what you're really looking at is being able to talk to customers and entering a vendor selection process and thinking about, you know, is this the right use case? Are these guys going to innovate quickly enough for us? Are they building the right levels of functionality? Is it the right rate of change? Are they moving in a good direction? You know, are these guys going to go under next year? What do we do? Do we need a software escrow? Once you have that in place, then you can start testing it out and trying to think about your data strategy, right? Is the way we define a customer the same inside our current systems and in the cloud. Um, if we're doing integration, do we want more than just point-to-point integration? Because, you know, this is going to be more than best of breed. So start thinking a little bit larger, bringing some enterprise architects in so they can sit there and plan out how, how business processes flow with each other, how the business intelligence reports come together, and then thinking about, you know, what your overall footprint is going to look like. So I think these are some things people can start thinking about. So who's buying cloud currently? Cloud kind of, you know, kind of came up from a bottom-up approach. The developers leveraged it. To your point, people were using it, what we call rogue clouds. They're using their credit cards to buy platform as a service time and software as a service time. So now it, that it's up at the sea level and the strategic level, who's inking the cloud opportunities out there currently? Strangely enough, CFOs, they're looking at their bottom line and they're saying, why do we have all this extra capacity? Why do we need all these servers? Do we really need all these people running this data center? Can we do this something else? So I think it's starting at that level. It's starting at the CIO level. They're starting to realize the cost savings between cloud and also thinking about tying that to virtualization on the infrastructure side. And then the business units, they're screaming for functionality. Uh, Most of the enterprise software companies out there have not delivered much innovation in the last 10 years. And so we see these startups popping up solving really specific needs. Um, we're looking at public sector and these, these companies that are doing specific types of permitting. Uh, we're looking at Internet of Things. Uh, there's a company called Streetline Networks that's providing metering systems for cities. There are incentive comp programs that are really helping people in pharma and biotech specifically going after you know, unique needs for that industry. Um, and so industry by industry, even geographical requirements are popping up because the cost of development, the speed and time to market are so powerful that business units are saying, hey, I want that. I want to test this out. Um, and this is 
you know, this is part of that groundswell of activity in terms of cloud adoption. And you're right, this is low cloud is still happening. The CIOs are making these big decisions, and business units are saying, I don't need you. I'm just going to go and procure. So the final question is, uh, in, in 10 years, what percentage of our IT is going to run in the public cloud? I love asking that question to everybody. You know, I got asked this question on the Pew Internet survey, and I just sat there and I said, what could possibly happen in 10 years? Right? Would we have like a big terrorist attack that came in and people then got all scared about leaving stuff into the cloud? You know, would the hackers out in China and Nigeria have compromised our systems to a point where we're just like thinking, you know, what do we do? And so I, I actually think that it'll probably be a little bit more than half, but I think everyone's going to have some kind of private cloud as their, as their backup strategy just in case. So I, I'm a little bit more cautious about it. If you asked me this like three years ago, I'd be like, yeah, everybody's going to be in the cloud. <laughs> but, but I don't think I'm that religious anymore. <laughs> Love it. I, I like the idea of the private cloud being the backup strategy. Let's see if that actually happens. Uh, I need to start wrapping things up here. I'd like to pull up on screen, though, um, your blog, A Software Insider's Point of View, so everyone can get a quick peek at that. Look at um, my screen here in studio. Um, your buy side advocate for enterprise app strategies, vendor selection, and contract negotiations. So guys, can we get that up on screen real quick? Just to give a peek here. You might be um, It should be. I um, guess we can't necessarily pull it up right now, but make sure you go to softwareinsider.org. That's where you can find his blog. Want to make sure that you all check that out as well. Um, and I believe that uh, we have a fun commercial that we want to share with you guys. So we're going to jump into that and give you a little sing along here before we wrap. You got a web show you want to create. You need something to make you look and sound really great. A lightweight, portable broadcast device. And for a TV studio, you can't beat the price. Tricaster, Tricaster. The web television user, Tricaster. Tricaster, Tricaster. The web television user, Tricaster. Audio mixing and special effects. Multi camera switching digital muscle flex. Playback clips on your live remote shoot. A chroma key green screen muscle to boot. Live production and virtual sets. A streaming like a pro across the internet. It's made of awesome and it's full of wind. The TriCast is what we use it this way again. TriCaster, TriCaster. The web television user TriCaster. Hey, nobody can say we don't have fun here at thisweekend.com. Yes, I was the portable broadcast device in that video. TriCaster, though, they, they're, an, they're awesome technology. We use them to switch our cameras here in the studio. Um, so real quick, we, we can pull up on screen a Software Insider's point of view. Just so you can get a quick peek there of Ray's blog, Software Insider's point of view, softwareinsider.org. But um, it's about all the time that we have for today. So, Ray, thank you again for joining us. Ray Wang with Altimeter Group and a Software Insider's point of view. Very excellent having you on the show. And please do come back again. Hey, thanks a lot. So I'll let you go. And also, of course, my trusty co-host over on the East Coast, Dave Linthicum. <laughs> Take care, guys. Talk to you next week. So if you want to sponsor thisweekend.com, send an email to sponsor at thisweekend.com. If you have ideas for the show, send them to me, Amanda, at thisweekend.com. Please, please go to iTunes, rate the show, comment on it, tell us what you think. But be sure to join us again next week. Same cloud time, same cloud channel. I'm your host, Amanda Kulong, This Week in Cloud Computing.